Hi, good morning. Um, welcome to IFA's Government Relations Webinar. Um, today, we have the privilege of um, hearing from the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division on compliance essentials for employers. Um, we are recording the webinar, so um, you'll be able to, to access the information later. Um, I want to, to thank those of you that submitted questions um, in advance during the registration process. Um, the Wage and Hour Division will be answering questions that were provided when registering for this webinar. Um, although they will not be taking live questions today, questions the audience may have for them can still be entered into the chat to help inform future presentations and resources. Um, so I'm going to kick it off first to Jessica Lumen. Um, she's the administrator of the U.S. Department of Labor's um, Wage and Hour Division. So thank you, Jessica, so much for the time today and um, look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined this uh, webinar today. Uh, we know you are very busy and have a lot going on in your organizations. So appreciate you taking the time, effort, and energy uh, to come and learn uh, more about the work that we're doing at the Wage and Hour Division and how we can partner with all of you. Um, as Sarah said, uh, I am the administrator of the uh, Wage and Hour Division at the U.S. Department of Labor. And um, our role and responsibility is really to make sure that we're enforcing some of the nation's most foundational federal worker protection laws. So the Wage and Hour Division, we enforce the federal minimum wage. We enforce overtime pay. We enforce federal child labor requirements, the family medical leave and many other worker protections. And today's webinar, today's um, session is really gonna talk a little bit about these protections, um, give you some information, but also most importantly, help you know where to go uh, when you need more help, more information, uh, because the Wage and Hour Division is very much here to help you. Um, our focus is on protecting low wage, uh, vulnerable workers across our country, um, including workers who may not know their rights or be afraid to come forward. Um, for example, last year, we found more than 35,000 workers who weren't even paid the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Um, and, and since the start of this administration, we've recovered more than $438 million uh, for over 390,000 workers who weren't paid the overtime wages that they had earned. So we at the Wage and Hour Division are really focused on a number of things, but the most important thing is prevention. Success for the Wage and Hour Division is making sure that all workers are paid correctly on payday. And by joining our webinar today, you can help make that happen. The other really important thing that we have to talk about as an economy, as a community, um, and as people who care about uh, making sure that our workplaces are safe is we have to protect the most vulnerable workers in our country, and those are kids. Um, we know we know that there are many good age appropriate work experiences that young people can have. Everybody on this call had their first job. Um, and we know that many of you on this call provide these types of great first job, first work experiences. Um, and we wanna partner with all of you to make sure we're highlighting best practices, making sure that we are keeping kids safe in workplaces. But unfortunately in the wage and hour division, we have seen an 88% increase in the number of children employed in violation of federal child labor laws. And the most concerning of this is where we are seeing children being employed in workplaces where they never should be in the first place. Under federal law, there are three types of restrictions on employing children. There are restrictions on the minimum age for employment. There are restrictions on the hours kids can work, but there are also prohibitions against children being employed to do dangerous work. And today we're going to discuss in more detail during this presentation um, all of these restrictions, but also how we can make sure that when we are employing young people in age-appropriate workplaces that we are keeping them safe. So we have a lot to cover today. I wanted to just give a brief uh, introduction, uh, but most importantly, and again, all of the information that we have today will be available to you on an ongoing basis, but most importantly, please know that the Wage and Hour Division, the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, we are here for you. We have 54 offices, uh, district offices nationwide. We have 200 field offices. Uh, we speak multiple languages uh, and we are really here to make sure again that we're preventing wage and hour violations from happening in the first place and that you have all of the information that you need uh, to make sure that you and your businesses can be successful. So thank you so much for joining us. Again, we know you're very busy and I am going to turn this over to my colleague, Bridget Dutton, 
who is going to give you information about uh, the wage and hour division, the federal laws that we enforce, and a little bit more about child labor. Bridget, over to you. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you so much for your leadership. As Jessica said, the Wage and Hour Division is committed to providing employers with the tools they need to operate in compliance with the variety of labor laws enforced by the division. We offer useful compliance resources intended to provide employers with readily accessible, easy to understand information relevant to both their rights and to their responsibilities under the law. My presentation today will provide an overview of who we are, what we do, as well as discuss some of the laws we enforce, including the Fair Labor Standards Act with an emphasis on child labor and the Family and Medical Leave Act. So as I said, let me briefly walk you through how the Wage and Hour Division is responsible for enforcing some of the nation's most comprehensive federal labor laws. Our mission is to promote and achieve compliance with labor standards and to protect and enhance the welfare of the nation's workforce. Simply put, we want to make sure working people in the U.S. receive the wages and protections they've earned and that their work is respected. We at the Wage and Hour Division are committed to ensuring that workers in this country are paid properly and for all the hours that they work. We're also dedicated to providing employers with the tools they need to operate in compliance with all of the laws that we enforce. We help workers, advocates, employers, and other stakeholders understand worker protections and employers' responsibilities. Collectively, our labor standards protect over 165 million workers in more than 11 million establishments nationwide. Our work reflects our strong commitment to protecting workers with our wage and hour offices across the country and over 200 languages spoken amongst our staff or through the use of translation services. Our division was created with the enactment of the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA of 1938. We cover virtually all private and state and local government employment. We're comprised of a nationwide staff of investigators, supervisors, and technical and clerical employees responsible for enforcing these laws. We have five regions and local district offices located throughout the country. We enforce federal minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping, and child labor requirements of the Fair Labor Standards Act. We also enforce the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act, wage garnishment, garnishment provisions of the Consumer Credit Protection Act, and several employment standards and worker protections as provided in several immigration-related statutes. Additionally, we administer and enforce the prevailing wage requirements of the Davis-Bacon and Related Acts and the Service Contract Act and other statutes applicable to federal contracts for construction and for the provisions of goods and services. Protections that the wage and hour ensures workers include payment of minimum wages and overtime, youth employment standards, job protections for time taken for the birth of a child or caring for sick family members, housing and transportation standards for farm workers, payment of prevailing wage rates for federally funded construction and service contract work, and standards for hiring and paying workers temporarily in the U.S. under our H-2A, H-1B, and H-2B visas. To achieve our mission, we draw on a set of tools that include enforcement, both complaint and directed investigations, outreach and education to employees and employers, and partnerships with agencies, community organizations, business associations, and other stakeholders. By using these tools, our success will be measured in terms of improving compliance levels, so that when we enter workplaces in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead, we will find fewer and fewer workers will have been subjected to violations. We work hard in Wage and Hour to build and maintain strong relationships with select nonprofit organizations to foster communication and better serve our nation's workers, including our young workers and businesses. 
Wage and Hour has memorandums of understanding or MOUs with state agencies and organizations across the country concerning the various laws that we enforce. These partnerships provide for data sharing, referrals, coordinated enforcement, joint outreach, and compliance assistance. They help us to maximize our impact and the corresponding benefits for both businesses and workers. We've long maintained at the Wage and Hour Division that enforcement alone will never be sufficient to achieve our mission. Education and outreach to workers and employers has been and will continue to be one of the division's key strategies for protecting the workforce and promoting compliance. Most employers want to comply with our laws if they understand them. Our compliance assistance and outreach work ensures that employers and employees have all the tools they need to clearly understand their responsibilities and to comply with the law and their rights as workers within this country. Now let's turn to some of the protections we provide under the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA. The FLSA requires payment of the current federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour, payment of overtime at time and one half a worker's regular rate of pay for hours worked over 40 in a work week, it requires accurate record keeping for employees, including a breakdown of daily and weekly hours worked, wages paid, and deductions made, and protections for young workers under the child labor portion of the act. The FLSA does not require vacation, holiday, severance, or sick pay, meal or rest periods, holidays off or vacations, though some state or local laws may require these, so make sure you check with your local state as well. The Wage and Hour Division can enforce the provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act only when an employment relationship exists between an employer and a worker. For a worker to be protected by the minimum wage and overtime pay requirements of the FLSA, the worker must be an employee of the employer meaning that there is an employment relationship between the worker and employer. Independent contractors do not have these protections. Whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor under the FLSA is determined by looking at the economic realities of the worker's relationship with the employer. If the economic realities show that the worker is economically dependent on the employer for work, then the worker is an employee. If the economic realities show that the worker is in business for themselves, then the worker is an independent contractor. Employment under the FLSA is not determined by technical concepts or common law standards of control. It is broader than the common law standard often applied to determine employment status under other federal laws. As mentioned in the last slide, a worker must be an employee for the FLSA's minimum wage and overtime pay protections to apply. Employers also have record keeping obligations when they hire employees and must refrain from retaliating against workers who seek information about or attempt to exercise their rights. Misclassifying employees as independent contractors, however, is a serious concern under the FLSA, as well as for businesses and the government generally because misclassification denies workers benefits and protections which they are entitled to receive under the FLSA, such as minimum wage and or overtime pay. Wage and Hour remains committed to addressing misclassification of employees as independent contractors. Importantly, employers may not misclassify an employee for any reason under the FLSA. When workers are misclassified, they're denied not only the protections of the FLSA, but also health insurance, workers' compensation, and unemployment insurance. They bear the tax burden of both the employee and employer contributions and contribute less to Social Security, which results in a reduced benefit. Additionally, law-abiding businesses must compete against an employer working with unfair and artificially lower labor costs, and the federal government loses millions of dollars in tax revenue that funds critical programs. FLSA coverage or protection is determined in two ways. First, employers who are engaged in a business that generates an annual dollar volume of sales or business done of at least $500,000 per year 
are covered on an enterprise basis by the FLSA and must pay all employees engaged or working in that business overtime and the minimum wage, unless one of the many exemptions of the law applies to the employee. Importantly, the key criterion for this provision is business or sales revenue. Coverage also applies to certain named enterprises, regardless of their revenue. If enterprise coverage doesn't apply, the second way the FLSA could extend to employees is individually. Individual coverage applies to employees whose work regularly involves them in commerce between states or interstate commerce, which for our purposes means individual workers who are engaged in commerce or in the production of goods for commerce. In the restaurant in industry, individual coverage is most commonly established when an employee processes a customer's credit card payment. If electronic credit card payments are sent across state lines for processing, the individual who runs the transaction is individually covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. Again, the FLSA requires payment of the current federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour. This may be more in some states. 30 states, including DC, Guam, and the Virgin Islands have minimum wages higher than the federal minimum wage. To determine whether an employee has been paid the minimum wage for all hours worked in each week, you need to add up all the compensation received and divide that amount by all hours worked for the week. Payment counted towards the minimum wage can include wages such as salary, hourly, piece rate, commissions, some bonuses, tips received by eligible employees, and the reasonable cost of room and board. This can also include other facilities provided by the employer for the employee's benefit. Other facilities provided by the employer could include such items as meals or transportation, Reasonable cost of fair value means room, board, or other facility is provided to you by your employer at the actual cost to your employer and not including a profit to them. Please note that although an employer may deduct from an employee's paycheck to repay a signing bonus or a payroll advance, the employer may not withhold the entire check. The employee must receive at least the federal minimum wage for all hours worked, even in the last paycheck. Typical problems we see here include a minimum wage employee working as a cashier is illegally required to reimburse the employer for a cash drawer shortage, or an employer furnishes elaborate uniforms to employees and makes them responsible for having the uniforms cleaned. And also, maybe in the instance where an employee driving the employer's vehicle causes a wreck and the employer holds the employee responsible for the repairs, thereby reducing the employee's wages below the minimum wage. Employees covered under the FLSA must be paid for all hours worked in a work week. In general, hours worked includes all time an employee must be on duty, or on the employer's premises, or at any other prescribed place of work from the beginning of the first principal activity of the workday to the end of the last principal work activity of the workday. Also included is any additional time the employee is allowed. For example, if they are suffered or permitted to work. Time spent by an employee in travel as part of their principal activity, such as travel from job site to job site or same franchisee during the workday, is work time and must be counted as hours worked. An example of waiting time that is hours, hours worked is when a care worker works from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. in a residential care facility for residents who nap from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. and is required to be available whenever any of the residents wake up. This is going to be considered hours worked. The employee is engaged to wait. Under the FLSA, if the employee is completely relieved from duty and able to use the time for his or her own purposes, the time generally is not considered hours work. Using that previous example, if the care worker is allowed to leave the premises while the residents are napping from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. for their own personal pursuits, then the time spent away from the premises has been used by the employee for their own purposes 
and is therefore not considered hours worked. An example of on-call time that is hours worked. Let's have a care worker working at a hospital um, on a shift from 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. and they're asked to remain on site until 4.30 p.m. during bad weather in case too many employees arrive late. Even if the care worker is ultimately not required to perform work, the worker is on duty on the employer's premises until 4.30 p.m. and that time is compensable. Another example might include a medical transport driver who's asked to remain on call one Monday per month. They may use the time as they wish, remain at home, attend to personal chores, attend social events, as long as they're able to get to the transport van within 30 minutes of being called. If a medical transport driver is called in for two hours on a Monday, that driver must be paid for the two hours of work, but not the remaining on-call time. Because these employees are free to use their time for their own purposes until they are called to work, only the two hours they actually worked are paid. In some cases, an employer may place some restrictions on an on-call employee, even when the time is not considered hours worked. For example, an on-call surgical technician or a nurse who passes medication or medical transport driver may be prohibited from drinking alcohol during on-call time or an employee may be asked to carry a cell phone or to remain within the city or county limits, those restrictions do not render the time hours worked. Rest periods of short duration, usually 20 minutes or less, are common in the industry and promote the efficiency of the employee. These are customarily paid for as working time. These short periods must be counted as hours worked. Bonafide meal periods, typically 30 minutes or more, generally need not be paid as work time. The employee must be completely relieved from duty for the purpose of eating regular meals. The employee is not relieved if he or she is required to perform any duties while active or inactive while eating. This slide explains that federal overtime is due for all hours worked over 40 in a work week. All time that is hours worked must be counted when determining the overtime hours worked for each work week. For example, the employer cannot add all the hours worked for a pay period that is two weeks and pay overtime after 80 hours. Each work week of 40 hours stands alone. The regular rate includes all earnings except certain payments that the employer may exclude such as holiday bonuses. Earnings may be determined on a piece rate, salary, commission, or some other basis, but in all such cases, the overtime paid due must be computed based on the average hourly rate. The average hourly rate is calculated by dividing the total pay, except statutory exclusions, in any work week by the total number of hours actually worked for that work week. As mentioned before, employers subject to any provision of the FLSA must make keep and maintain certain records. Time clocks are not necessarily required and records don't need to be kept in any particular form. Every covered employer must keep basic records for each worker with additional requirements for certain non-exempt workers. Federal law requires employers to provide reasonable break time for an employee to express breast milk for her nursing child for one year after the child's birth, each time such employee has the need to express milk. Employers are also required to provide a place other than a bathroom that is shielded from view and free from intrusion from coworkers and the public, which must be used by an employee to express breast milk. Employers are required to provide a reasonable amount of break time to express bre breast milk as frequently as needed by the nursing mother. A bathroom, even if private, is not permissible location under the Fair Labor Standards Act. The location provided must be functional as a space for expressing milk. Employees are entitled to break time to express milk if they are employees who must be paid overtime under Section 7 of the FLSA. Employees who are exempt from overtime are not entitled to breaks to express milk under federal law. Employers are not required under the FLSA to compensate nursing mothers for breaks taken for the purpose of expressing milk. However, where employers already provide compensated breaks, 
an employee who uses that break time to express milk must be compensated in the same way that other employees are compensated for a break time. Employees are eligible to pump at work for one year after their child's birth if they are covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act and not subject to narrow exemptions. The FLSA again applies to or covers full-time and part-time employees in the private sector and in federal, state, and local governments. Nearly all workers in the U.S. are covered by the FLSA, and nearly all nursing employees are eligible to pump at work for up to one year after their child's birth. While most workers are covered, there are a few exemptions affecting worker eligibility to pump at work. These exemptions are limited to certain employees of small companies if compliance would impose an undue hardship, and to certain employees in the air, rail, and motor co coach service industries. The Department of Labor is dedicated to helping young workers find those positive and early employment experiences, but the work must be safe. The child labor provisions of the FLSA were enacted to ensure that when young people work, the work does not jeopardize their health or well being. Generally, the minimum age for employment is 14, although there are some exceptions and exemptions for children under the age of 14 that allow them to babysit on a casual basis, um, provide newspapers, and work as actors or performers, for example. However, the FLSA groups into two categories for employment purposes, 14 and 15 year olds in one group and 16 and 17 year olds in the second group. Simply stated, employees aged 14 and 15 years may only work outside of school hours and only for certain time periods, which we will discuss further. They may only work in non-manufacturing, non-mining, and non-dangerous jobs. However, employees that are aged 16 and 17 years may perform any job that is not considered dangerous and with no limit to the number of hours that they work. The child labor regulations do not apply to any employee that is 18 years of age or older. Last, there is a parental exemption for a person who is the sole owner of a business. A child who works for a company that is entirely owned by their parent may work longer hours, and they also have fewer job restrictions. The number of hours that 14 and 15 year olds may work depends on whether school is in session or not. For example, when school is in session, 14 and 15 year olds may not work more than 18 hours. However, when school is not in session, 14 and 15 year olds may work up to 40 hours in each week. Additionally, 14 and 15 year olds may only work between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. except from June 1st through Labor Day when the evening hour is extended to 9 p.m. Hour standards violations are very common when discovering child labor violations for 14 and 15 year olds. Let me point out that many states have different standards and employers should check with both state and federal agencies to ensure compliance. Where state and federal laws are different, the most protective law applies. So let's review what jobs 14 and 15 year olds can and cannot do. Generally, 14 and 15 year olds can serve as cashiers, models, participate in artwork and advertising, serve as dishwashers, office and clerical jobs, bagging and carrying out groceries, food prepping by hand, operating as a server or busser, stocking shelves, and certified 15-year-olds may work as lifeguards at swimming pools and amusement parks. Generally, 14 and 15-year-olds cannot participate in manufacturing, mining or processing, baking or cooking, serving as a public messenger, participating in construction work, including roofing, using or cleaning power-driven equipment, loading and unloading equipment, working in freezers or walk-in coolers, or participate in door-to-door -door sales. Please remember that anything not permitted is prohibited. Although we have been making the distinction between children who are 14 and 15 and those that are 16 and 17, dangerous jobs applies to all children under 18 for work that is not on farms. 
You may be asking yourself, what is a hazardous occupation, also known as an HO? An HO is work that the Secretary of Labor has determined is too dangerous for children under the age of 18 to work. There are 17 HOs for work that is not performed on farms. On the next few slides, we will discuss a few of the HOs that are off limits for children under the age of 18. However, please visit our website where we host additional compliance assistance materials, which provide more detailed information for the work children can and cannot do both with farm jobs and non-farm jobs. HO number two bans driving motor vehicles on public roads and working as outside helpers on motor vehicles. Children generally cannot drive a car, truck, or other vehicle for work or ride on the outside of the vehicle. Some examples of violations include delivering pizzas from a personal vehicle, operating an ATV, motorcycle, or motor scooter on public roads, and riding outside the cab on a garbage truck. HO number 11 involves work with bakery machines and generally bans children from using, operating, cleaning, maintaining, or repairing mechanical dough mixers, dough rollers, or other types of bakery machines. 14 and 15 year olds may not perform any part of the baking process, such as weighing and mixing ingredients, placing or assembling products in pans or on trays, operating ovens, including convection ovens, toaster ovens, pizza ovens, automatic feeding ovens, and microwave ovens, except those microwave ovens used for warming food. They should not be removing items from ovens, placing items on cooling trays, and finishing baked products. Federal law generally bans minors from using, riding on, or repairing forklifts, cranes, and other types of power-driven hoisting or lifting machines. And HO12 involves work with power-driven product machines like compactors and balers. Miners generally cannot use, load, unload, clean, or repair these machines. Special exemptions do apply to student learners and apprentices though for this HO. In some circumstances, 16 and 17 year olds can load but not unload certain machines used only for paper. Generally, minors under age 18 shouldn't load, operate, or unload scrap paper balers and paper box compactors. This includes equipment that processes other materials in addition to paper, such as trash, aluminum cans, glass, and foam rubber. The Wage and Hour Division recently encountered some of the most significant child labor cases in our history. In fiscal year 2023, we concluded 955 investigations that found child labor violations, a 14% increase from the previous year. We found nearly 5,800 children and employed in violation of the law, and an 88% increase since 2019. We assessed more than $8 million in penalties, which is an 83% increase from the previous year. We issued a $1.5 million penalty against Packer Sanitation Services for employing at least 102 children from ages 13 to 17 years in hazardous occupations and had them working overnight shifts at 13 meat processing facilities in eight states. We found that children were working with hazardous chemicals and cleaning meat processing equipment. Investigators learned at least three minors suffered injuries while working for PSSI. Florence Hardwoods, a Wisconsin sawmill operator, illegally employed nine children to operate hazardous machinery, machinery tragically resulting in one child's fatal, fatal work-related injury. The company also employed seven children ages 14 and 15 years old to work outside legally permitted hours. This slide summarizes some of the main activities and contributions that the Wage and Hour Division makes to support the prevention and elimination of human trafficking. Wage and Hour actively engages and collaborates with federal and state law enforcement partners by participating in over 80 human trafficking task force across the country. We are uniquely positioned by often being the first government agency in a business to detect and refer possible human trafficking indicators identified during the normal course of investigation. 
When such indicators are detected, we follow established protocols to make referrals to our law enforcement partners. When requested through proper channels by another federal agency, typically an assistant United States attorney or criminal law enforcement agency, we will provide advice or participate in the computation of restitution for victims or penalties against the traffickers. Retaliation occurs when an employer through a manager, supervisor, administrator, or directly fires an employee or takes any other type of adverse action against an employee for engaging in protected activity. An adverse action is an action which would dissuade a reasonable employee from raising a concern about a possible violation or engaging in other related protected activity. Retaliation can have a negative impact on overall employee morale. What are examples of protected activity? Well, they include filing a complaint with the Wage and Hour Division, complaints made to a manager or employer, testifying at a trial, cooperating during a Wage and Hour investigation, requesting payment of wages, refusing to kick back wages to the employer, complaints by a third party on behalf of an employee, consulting with Wage and Hour staff, or exercising rights or attempting to exercise rights. For example, requesting Family Medical Leave Act leave. For over 30 years, the Family Medical Leave Act or FEMLA has provided the nation's workforce with the right to balance the demands of their work and family lives. The FEMLA is a federal law that provides eligible employees of covered employers with the right to job protective leave for qualifying family and medical reasons. The Wage and Hour Division administers and enforces family medical leave, and this part of our presentation will provide a general overview of FEMLA's protections and processes, and it includes references to resources for further exploration. Eligible employees have the right to use up to 12 work weeks of FEMLA leave in a 12-month period, and up to 26 work weeks of leave during a single 12 month period for military caregiver leave. During the leave period, the employee has the right to maintain group health insurance benefits on the same terms as if they had continued to work. Generally, the employee must be reinstated to the same coverage levels, including family or dependent coverages as before their leave began. After using FEMLA leave, an employee has the right to return to their same job or to an equivalent job, one that is virtually identical to their original job in terms of pay, benefits, and other employment terms and conditions. An employee should usually be able to return from FEMLA leave to their original schedule and work location. The Family Medical Leave Act is a federal worker protection law. Employers may not interfere with, restrain, or deny the exercise of, or the attempt to exercise any FEMLA right. An employee may not be punished for using FEMLA leave. For example, employers may not discriminate or retaliate against employees who have exercised or attempted to exercise any FEMLA right and cannot use the taking of FEMLA leave against the employee and applying points under attendance policies. FEMLA leave is unpaid, but employees may use paid leave at the same time they take FEMLA leave if the reason they're using FEMLA leave is color covered by the employer's paid leave policy. An employee may request or the employer may requ require an employee to use their paid leave during FEMLA leave. However, the employer may not delay the application of FEMLA's protections to qualifying leave. Additionally, some states have their own family and medical leave laws. Nothing in the Family Medical Leave Act prevents employees from receiving protections or ben benefits under other laws. Workers have the right to benefit from all the laws that apply. Employees may use FEMLA leave when they take time off of work for the birth, adoption, or foster care placement of a child and to bond with the child. Workers can also take FEMLA leave for their own serious health condition and to care for a family member with a serious health condition, including leave for prenatal visits and incapacity related to pregnancy. Leave to care for a qualifying family member includes both physical care and physiological comfort, 
and may include, for example, situations where because of the serious health condition, the family member is unable to care for their own basic needs or safety or is unable to transport themselves to the doctor. It may also include providing psychological comfort and reassurances to the family member. The employee does not need to be the only individual or family member able to provide such care. Qualifying exigencies may arise when the employee's spouse, child, or parent is a member of the armed forces, including the National Guard and Reserves, and is on covered active duty or has been notified of an impending call or order to cover active duty. Military caregiver leave provides an eligible employee who is the spouse, child, parent, or next of kin of a covered service member the right to use up to 26 work weeks of leave during a single 12-month period to care for a covered service member with a serious injury or illness. A covered service member can include a current service member or a veteran. To be eligible to take FEMLA leave, an employee must work for a covered employer, work at a site where at least 50 employees are employed either at or within 75 miles of the site, have worked for that employer for at least 12 months, and have at least 1,250 hours of service during the 12 months prior to the start of the FEMLA leave. The 12 months do not have to be consecutive. However, periods of employment prior to a break in service of seven years or more do not need to be counted in determining the 12 months, except in certain limited circumstances. The employer could, would have to consider employment before a seven-year break in service where the break in service is the result of an employee's fulfillment of a National Guard or Reserve military service obligation, or where a written agreement exists, including collective bargaining agreement or CBA concerning the employer's intention to rehire the employee after the break in service. To determine if an employee has 1,250 hours of service in the 12 months prior to the start of FEMLA leave, generally the actual hours worked as defined by the FLSA are counted. Paid or unpaid leave, including FEMLA leave, does not count as hours worked. If an employee has worked an average of more than 24 hours a week during the 12 months before the leave starts, the employee will generally meet the hours worked eligibility test. Special eligibility requirements apply to airline flight crew employees. The Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, which is enforced by the department's Veterans Employment and Training Service, or VETS, requires employers to count the months and hours that military members would have worked if they had not been called up for military service towards FEMLA eligibility. The FMLA covers all private sector employees who employ 50 or more employees, again, for at least 20 calendar work weeks in the current or preceding calendar year, including joint employers and successors of covered employers. Public agencies, including state, local, and federal employers, and local education agencies, those include public and private elementary and secondary schools. FEMLA applies to public agencies and schools, whether public or private, regardless of the number of employees. A joint employment relationship generally will be considered to exist under the Family Medical Leave Act in situations such as where there's an arrangement between employers to share an employee's services or to interchange employees, where one employer acts directly or indirectly in the interest of the other employer in relation to the employee, and where the employers are not completely disassociated with respect to the employee's employment and may be deemed to share control of the employee directly or indirectly because one employer controls, is controlled by, or is under common control with the other employer. After using FEMLA leave, an employee again must be able to return to their same job or to an equivalent job. We've defined what an equivalent job means, but again, it's virtually identical to the employee's original job in terms of pay, benefits, and other employment terms and conditions. An employee should usually be able to return from FEMLA to their original schedule and work location. An equivalent job also includes the same or equivalent pay premiums, such as shift differential, the same opportunity for overtime, any unconditional pay increases that occur while the employee was on FEMLA leave, such as cost of living increases, 
and any unconditional bonuses or payments. Some pay increases and bonuses are based on meeting certain requirements or achieving a goal. For example, an employee may be able to earn a pay increase based on their seniority, length of service, work performance, attendance history, or safety record. Employees who use FEMLA leave have the same right to conditional pay increases, bonuses, or payments as employees who use similar types of leave. The FEMLA does require that benefits such as life insurance, disability insurance, sick leave, vacation, educational benefits, pensions, retirement, also be available when the employee returns from FEMLA. These benefits must be resumed in the same manner and at the same level as when the leave began, unless changes came about that affected the entire workforce. Again, an employee returning from FEMLA leave does not have to requalify for any benefits they enjoyed before the leave began. Employers cannot use the taking of FEMLA leave as a negative factor in employment actions, such as hiring, promotions, or disciplinary actions. Again, examples of prohibited conduct include refusing to authorize FEMLA leave for an eligible employee, discouraging an employee from using FEMLA leave, manipulating an employee's work hours to avoid responsibilities under the Family Medical Leave Act, using an employee's request for or use of FEMLA leave as a negative factor in employment actions, such as, again, hiring promotions or disciplinary, disciplinary actions, or counting FEMLA leave under the no-fault attendance policies. Any violations of the Family Medical Leave Act or the department's regulations constitute interfering with, restraining, or denying the exercise of rights provided by the Family Medical Leave Act. I've shared a lot of information with you today, but as Jessica said, you can always contact us to learn more. You can contact us at our 1-866-4-US-WAGE or 1-866-487-9243 or visit us at our website. If you call us, you'll be directed to the nearest wage and hour office to you for assistance. There are offices throughout the country with trained professionals ready to help you with questions or concerns. Feel free to connect with us as well on all of our social media platforms to follow our current activities, whether it's related to enforcement or our outreach and compliance assistance programs. That ends my portion of today's webinar. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Serena Bazil Cox, a wage and hour specialist and senior advisor in the division of the Fair Labor Standards Act at the wage and hour division to provide answers to your questions previously submitted when registering for this webinar. Serena. Thanks, Bridget. Let me make sure that I, there we go. So thank you so much. And again, thank you all um, IFA for joining us today. Um, we received many questions and so I will start. The first question that I have is, what is the most common issue Wage Hour has seen or cited franchise employers for with respect to child labor? Now, under the law, under the federal law, there are three types of restrictions um, on the employment of children. And as Jessica mentioned earlier, there are restrictions on the minimum age for employment, restrictions on hours worked, and the prohibition against children being employed to do dangerous work. Some of the more common child labor violations that the Wage and Hour Division finds among franchise employers include 14 and 15 year old workers employed longer or later than the FLSA allows, 14 and 15 year old workers employed in prohibited occupations such as baking, cooking, and work in freezers and or meat coolers, and workers under the age of 18 employed in dangerous jobs, such as driving vehicles or operating power-driven machines, including meat slicers, dough mixers, balers, trash compactors, and forklifts, for example. 
The next question I have is, what issues should franchise employers be most aware of regarding the employment of workers under the age of 18? At the Wage and Hour Division, we believe everyone involved in a young worker's life, including their employers, can play a role in keeping children out of harm's way. We know that franchise employers can help ensure that teenagers' first jobs are good, safe jobs. And we know that employers may be able to influence business practices based on their economic position or advocacy role within an industry. But to ensure that young workers' well-being and educational opportunities are not jeopardized by their first work experiences, franchise employers should be aware, as Bridget discussed in her presentation, the minimum age of employment in non-agricultural work, which is 14. The specific limits to daily and weekly work hours for 14 and 15 year olds, especially when school is in session. Also, be aware of the jobs that are prohibited for workers between the ages of 14 and 15 and the dangerous jobs that are considered hazardous for all workers under the age of 18. Franchise employers should also be aware of the extensive online tools and confidential compliance assistance that the Wage and Hour Division offers in our 200 local offices across the country. We offer a wealth of information and resources about child labor protections and employer responsibilities. Our website and our trained professionals throughout the United States can provide specific details on the FLSA's hours and occupation standards that keep young workers safe. The next question is, what resources are available to assist IFA members in complying with federal child labor laws? Well, in addition to our 200 local offices across the country, the Wage and Hour Division has 54 community outreach specialists nationwide who can facilitate events and partnerships in your area to promote compliance with child labor laws. Our website also includes several resources to help IFA members comply with child labor laws. On our website, you will find a youth rules webpage with child labor information and videos for employers, parents, educators, and young workers, fact sheets, posters, and employer self-assessment tools. We also have a webpage with seven, seven child labor best practices for employers and a guide to jobs and tasks that are off limits for anyone under the age of 18. Of course, we also have that toll-free helpline that Bridget mentioned at 1-866-4-US-WAGE to offer confidential compliance assistance. And we speak with callers in more than 200 languages. The next question I have is, are there national minimum wage raises coming soon? At the Wage and Hour Division, we administer and enforce laws as enacted by Congress. Although there may be updates to the federal minimum wage proposed in Congress, we cannot comment on those while they are still in the proposal phase. Currently, Congress has set the federal minimum wage at $7.25 an hour for most workers. We also know that many states and localities across the country have different minimum wages. In fact, we have a guide to state minimum wage laws on our website that's updated regularly. Fortunately, there's a simple principle to follow no matter where a franchise employer operates. The law that provides the greatest worker protections applies. In other words, if an employer is subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act, then the FLSA sets a floor on wages. 
state laws can provide more protection and a higher minimum wage than the FLSA, but states cannot provide lesser protections. If state laws are weaker than the protections provided under federal labor laws, the federal labor law prevails. The next question I have is, with respect to overtime, what is the most common concern or compliance issue that DOL has seen with franchise employers and overtime? Violations of overtime rules continue to be the most common of all Fair Labor, Stat all Fair Labor Standards Act violations. As Jessica mentioned, since the start of this administration, the Wage and Hour Division has recovered more than $438 million for over 390,000 workers who were not paid the overtime wages that they had earned. Common overtime violations among franchise employers and others include paying overtime at straight time rates, failing to pay for pre and post shift hours, failing to pay for all hours worked, and failing to combine hours worked when an employee works in more than one position and or more than one establishment. The next question I have is, what tools does the department offer employers, especially small employers, to ensure that they are classifying employees correctly as exempt or non-exempt and thus eligible for overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, one of Wage and Hour's top priorities is ensuring that workers receive overtime protections. Our website offers several tools to help employers comply with federal overtime rules, including a small entity compliance guide. On April 23rd, 2024, the Department of Labor announced the final rule, defining and delimiting the exemptions for executive, administrative, professional, outside sales, and computer employees. This rulemaking updates and revises the regulations for determining whether certain salaried employees are exempt from minimum wage and overtime requirements under Section 13A1 of the FLSA. Employees are exempt if they are employed in a bona fide executive, administrative, or professional capacity as those terms are defined in the Department of Labor's regulations at 29 CFR Part 541. This exemption from the FLSA is sometimes referred to as the EAP exemption. We urge franchise employers to go to dol.gov forward slash OT to watch a recorded webinar on the final rule, view a comprehensive chart of all the earnings thresholds for EAP employees, and to find frequently asked questions and answers. We received a number of questions related to joint employment under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is separate from the National Labor Relations Act standard. A joint, a strong joint employer standard is critical because FLSA responsibilities and liability for worker protections apply only to businesses that meet the definition of employer. The department understands the importance of the franchise business model to help people start their own small businesses. And since the enactment of the FLSA in 1938, the law has always contemplated that a worker could be employed by more than one employer while doing the same work. The Wage and Hour Division will continue to follow applicable law and judicial precedent when evaluating joint employment relationships. So this concludes the question and answer portion of the webinar. And again, thank you for your questions. And I will now turn it back over to Sarah Davis. Thank you.
Thank you, Serena. That was um, incredibly helpful. And, and if you have additional questions, um, as we said at the beginning, feel free to um, submit them into the chat and we will provide them to um, Jessica and Bridget and Serena so that it can shape future presentations um, in addition to accessing all of the resources that, that Serena just mentioned. Um, I want to thank again Jessica and Bridget and Serena for um, the really practical and informative session. Um, again, it's recorded and we'll make that available to um, registrants to the program afterwards. And thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Bye.